Welcome to the Chapter 2, Part 2 lecture. You should use the information in this lecture to fill out your Chapter 2, Part 2 guided notes, which should be completed before you come to class. Now in this part of the chapter, we're going to discuss how atoms work together to make bonds and to make molecules. First, let's define what a bond is. A bond is an interaction between two atoms. Typically, this involves the electrons in some way. And the atoms don't actually have to be hooked together. They can just be strongly attracted to one another. Whenever two atoms make a bond, they make something called a molecule. There are different kinds of combinations of atoms that exist. If molecules form that involve only one kind of atom, then we call that thing an element or an elemental molecule. A great example of this is O2, or oxygen gas that we breathe, because it's only made of oxygen atoms. Or a bar of pure gold would only be made of gold atoms. Compounds are molecules that contain different types of atoms. So for instance, water is a good example of a compound because it contains hydrogen and oxygen in combination. Table salt contains both sodium and chlorine. Now within a compound, the atoms are chemically bonded together. So they're not just hanging out together. They are attracted to one another for some reason, which we'll get into later. Mixtures are combinations of chemicals that are physically combined, but not chemically combined. So they're not bound together. A good example of this is sand and water. If you take a handful of sand and throw it in some water, they are going to be combined together, but they're not going to be chemically bound together forever. You could separate the sand from the water by filtering it, so by a physical means. Another fun example of a mixture is blood. And here's a nice slide of some blood over here. You can see all the cells. Blood consists of both um, solid parts, the cells, and liquid called plasma. And you can separate out these different elements using physical means. For instance, you can centrifuge blood and pull a lot of the cells out of it. So these are examples of mixtures. There are several different ways to represent molecules, and the most common is a molecular or chemical formula. In a molecular or a chemical formula, we use atomic symbols in combination with numbers, subscripts, and coefficients to represent the types of atoms involved in a molecule and the numbers of those atoms. So for instance, in H2O, the subscript 2 tells you that you have two hydrogen atoms involved and only one oxygen atom involved in that molecule, in that unit. Now, if you were to see it with a two in front of it, that's called a coefficient. And a coefficient tells you how many of these molecules you have. So if you just saw H2O by itself, that would tell you that you have one molecule of that in a jar, for instance. But if you saw two H2O, that would tell you that you have in your jar. This diagram illustrates some of the other ways that we can represent molecules. First, we have that chemical formula again, like H2O. We also have something called a structural formula, which I will often refer to as a line model. And in a structural formula, the bonds between the atoms are shown with little sticks, little lines. And these are specifically covalent bonds, which we'll talk about in a little bit. There are also structural models. You'll see these a lot in your textbook, and these are three-dimensional models of a molecule. And finally, there are shell models. Shell models show the electron shells and the placement of the electrons on those shells. So you can see the interactions of the electrons between the different atoms involved. So we are going to play with both shell models, structural formulas, and we'll get into chemical formulas as well in this chapter. So why do atoms want to form molecules in the first place? 
Well, this has to do with the number of valence electrons that they have, and one of the biggest reasons is something we call the octet rule. The octet rule tells us that a happy atom will have a full valence shell. Now, if that atom can't completely fill that valence shell, if it can at least get eight electrons in that valence shell, it's pretty happy. So for instance, if we have hydrogen, hydrogen has an atomic number of one, which means it has one little electron on this first shell. Now that shell won't hold eight electrons, but if it could add another electron to that shell, it would meet the octet rule and it would be happy. Other atoms are bigger. Carbon, for instance, has six electrons. Ooh, that's terrible. So it puts two in the first, and then it's going to put four more in the second shell. Terrible drawing. Okay, so how many can that second shell hold? Well, we could put four more in there to make eight. So a happy atom wants to either have a full valence shell, or if it can't totally fill it, eight is the magic number. Atoms that do not meet the octet rule are reactive, and they want to interact with other atoms to fulfill the octet rule. So how do atoms go about fulfilling this octet rule? Well, there's several ways they can get electrons. They can steal electrons. If they have too many, they can give them away. Or they can share electrons with other atoms. And this helps balance them out and helps them meet that octet rule. Because of the octet rule, different atoms can make different numbers of bonds. And that's all dependent on the number of valence electrons that they have. So you need to be able to determine how many valence electrons an atom has. You did this in part one of the lecture by looking at the atomic number, counting out the number of electrons, and putting them on the proper shells. And I do want you to be able to do that for test one. There is a second method, though, and it involves the periodic table. If you look at the periodic table, you'll notice that these different columns have numbers. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then up here it goes to 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay? You can use these column numbers to tell you how many valence electrons these atoms have. So all of these guys in this first column here have one valence electron. All the ones in the second one have two. Now to make this work, you need to skip this middle portion, okay? So where it sinks down in the middle, skip that. And then the very next column you see is number three. It's actually number 13. But those atoms will have three valence electrons and so on. I'd like you to complete this your turn before you come to class. It's going to give you a little bit of practice with valence electrons. What you need to do is look up the atomic number for each of these elements, determine the number of valence electrons that each has, either by counting them up or by looking at a periodic table and looking at the column header, and then I want you to apply the octet rule um, to this situation. I want you to look at the valence shell and say, well, how many valence electrons are there? How many more does it need to meet the octet rule? If it has just one or two in the valence shell, then you can say, well, how many would it need to lose to meet the octet rule? Because they can ditch electrons too and make the next shell down their valence, and that fulfills the octet rule as well. So let me give you an example. The atomic number for carbon is six. If you count that out, the number of valence electrons it has is four. So to meet the octet rule, it could either gain or lose four electrons. Now, in the case of carbon, it's going to gain four electrons. It wants to get four from somewhere, okay, rather than lose. Fill this chart out and bring it to class with you. To meet the octet rule, atoms are going to make bonds with one another. They're going to interact with one another. There are four different types of bonds we're going to go over in this lecture, and we'll take them one at a time.
Welcome to Dogs Teaching Chemistry. Our first lesson is chemical bonding. Chemical bonds are what holds atoms together. A chemical bond is an attraction between atoms that allows the formation of a chemical substance. The electrons that participate in a chemical bond are called valence electrons. These are electrons that are found in an atom's outermost shell. Let's take a look at the types of chemical bonds that can be formed between atoms. An ionic bond is formed when one of the atoms will lose its electron to the other atom. This results in a positively charged ion, called a cation, and a negatively charged ion, called an anion. Positive and negative attract, and the result is an ionic bond. Covalent chemical bonds involve the sharing of a pair of valence electrons by two atoms. There is also what is called polar covalent bonds. These are covalent bonds in which the sharing of the electron pair is unequal. The result is a bond where the electron pair is displaced toward the more electronegative atom. Thanks for watching! And we'll see you guys next time. First type of bond is known as an ionic bond. Ionic bonds occur between ions. So first, we need to discuss what an ion is. An ion is an atom that has either gained or lost one or some of its electrons. For instance, over here we have chlorine. Now chlorine has an atomic number of 17, so if you count out its electrons, that means that it has seven on its valence shell. It needs to get one more to be happy to fulfill the octet rule. So it has a tendency to steal these electrons from other atoms and add it to itself. Now after it's done that, it will have eight electrons in the valence shell. So it's more stable that way. It's more happy, it's happier that way. It will also get a charge. Since that little electron had a negative charge and it added it to itself, the entire atom is gonna have a negative charge. We can show this by listing the atomic symbol and putting a negative charge after it. A negative charge indicates that an atom has gained an electron. If it has a negative two charge, that would tell you that it's gained two electrons. Atoms can lose electrons as well. Here we have sodium. Sodium has an atomic number of 11, which means that it has 11 electrons and one sad little electron on that third shell all by itself. Now it's much easier for sodium to ditch that little electron than to gain seven more to meet the octet rule. So that's what it tends to do. It tends to give that electron away. It's got this annoying extra. Now when it does that, the second shell becomes the valence, which is full with eight, and it's happy that way. Now because electrons are negative, and it gave it away, that means that it's going to have a positive charge overall. The atom will be positively charged. Another way to think of it is that this atom will have 11 protons in the nucleus that are positive, but only 10 electrons out here ooh, that are negative. So if you add that up, you get a positive one charge. We would express this by saying in a plus, and that indicates that that atom has lost an electron. If it said Na plus two, that would indicate that it has lost two electrons. These types of reactions can result in two different kinds of ions. Cations are atoms that have lost an electron and therefore have a positive charge. So sodium was our example of a cation in the last example.
atoms that have gained electrons we call anions and they have a negative charge. So chlorine was an example of an anion in the last example. Now how do you remember these two words? Well here's my dumb memory trick. When I think of the word cation, I think of the Cheshire cat. The Cheshire cat has this really big positive smile. So, oh, that's weird looking. Um, so cation, positive, positive charge. When I think of the word anion, anion looks a lot like the word onion to me. So I think of a big old negative stinky onion. And that reminds me of the negative charge. Now when we put anions and cations together, they can form a bond known as an ionic bond. For instance, when we put sodium and chlorine together, sodium will give its electron to chlorine. Sodium will get a positive charge, chlorine will get a negative charge, and because opposites attract, remember Paula Abdul, a bond will form between these atoms. Now notice they're not overlapping, they're just attracted to one another. So we show this with a little lightning bolt here. Not a solid line, not a dotted line, a weird little lightning bolt. Those are bonded together. Compounds that form with ionic bonds tend to form what we call salts. Salts are crystals in shape, so they make these repeating patterns that are kind of neat. And yes, table salt is sodium chloride. It's a great example of an ionically bonded compound. Ionic bonds tend to form between metals and nonmetals. So what are those? Well, these are just classifications for the uh, different elements. And the nonmetals are these, hydrogen, and then all of these guys in orange from here over to the right of the periodic table. These are our nonmetals. The metals are the ones in gray. So now notice, in table salt, we had a metal, sodium, and a nonmetal, chlorine, making that bond. Ionic bonds tend to form between metals and nonmetals. They are most common between these guys in the first and second column over here, and in these columns over here. And the reason is that these guys have one or two extra electrons that they like to give away, and these guys have one, two, or three electrons that they would love to get. The second kind of bond we'll address is called a covalent bond. Now think about that word, co as in community, as in sharing, and valent as in valence shell. What happens in a covalent bond is that two atoms that need electrons will get really close together. They will overlap their valence shells. So that one's overlapping with this one here. And they will share electrons. When they're sharing an electron, that means that the electron from one atom can zoom around the nucleus of the original, or it can zoom around the nucleus of the new atom that it's interacting with. So this is a sharing bond. Now neither atom really gains an electron, but they have access to it, and it kind of helps balance them out. Here, for instance, we have a water molecule, and it is covalently bonded. Each hydrogen needs one electron to be happy, and each oxygen needs two electrons to be happy. So this big old oxygen has cozied up with this hydrogen. It's sharing an electron with that, makes them both happy. And since it needs two electrons to be happy, it has to share with a second hydrogen to fulfill the octet rule. So now the electrons can fly around the valence shell of the oxygen or the hydrogens, and it stabilizes them. We consider the sharing of one electron pair to be one bond. Atoms that make covalent bonds can share different numbers of electrons. Here we see two atoms making a single covalent bond. These are both hydrogen atoms, and each of these atoms just needs one more electron to be happy. So each hydrogen has an electron, and it's going to share it with the other. That means that occasionally two electrons will be flying around either of the nuclei, and that helps ba balance them out. 
when they are only sharing a single electron with each other, we call that a single bond, a single covalent bond. And we represent that in the structural model with a little stick between the two symbols. This is hydrogen gas, or H2. Atoms can share two or three electrons with each other. If they share two electrons with each other, we call this a double covalent bond. And oxygen gas, O2, is a great example of that. Each oxygen atom in this molecule needs two electrons to be happy. So they can overlap. This one can share two with that one. That one can share two with that one, and it helps balance them out. We call that a double bond. In the structural model, we represent that with a little equal sign between the two symbols. Again, this is O2 gas, or oxygen gas, that we breathe. Atoms can share three electrons as well. We see this with nitrogen gas, or N2, and we represent that with three little lines. This nitrogen is sharing three electrons with this nitrogen, and this one's sharing three with this one. So we call that a triple bond. Tetra bonds or quadruple bonds are possible on paper, but we don't really see them on, in nature because they put too much strain on the atoms trying to share. So single doubles or triples are about it. Covalent bonds tend to form between non-metal atoms. So for instance, you might see hydrogen and oxygen getting together to form water, or you could see um, chlorine and hydrogen getting together to form methane. Covalent bonds can result in something known as polarity. And polarity results from an unequal sharing of electrons. Polarity occurs when you have a very electronegative atom sharing electrons with uh, atoms that are not very electronegative. So what is electronegativity? Well, this refers to an atom's ability to attract electrons very strongly. Certain atoms are more electronegative than others. Fluorine, for instance, is very electronegative. It really attracts electrons strongly to it. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is not very electronegative. In general, the larger an atom is, the more electronegative it is, although there are exceptions to that. When we have a very electronegative atom sharing with a, an, an atom that is not very electronegative, we end up with something known as a polar molecule. Polar molecules have charges. So let's take a look at that. Water is a great example of a polar molecule. Here we have an oxygen atom that's big and very electronegative, sharing with two little hydrogens that are small and not very electronegative. Now what that means is that even though the electrons that are being shared here can zoom around both nuclei, they're actually going to spend most of their time around that oxygen. Because the oxygen is very electronegative, it's going to hog those electrons. Now what does this mean in terms of charges? Well, because electrons are negative and because they're hanging out around this nucleus, it's going to give that oxygen atom a negative charge, a partial negative charge. The hydrogens, on the other hand, are sort of deprived of these electrons. And because the electrons are negative, those hydrogens are going to end up with a slight positive charge. So polar molecules do not share electrons equally, and they have slight charges. So how do you know by looking at a molecule whether it's polar or not? Well, there are a couple of tricks to this. One thing you want to look at is how lopsided that molecule is. If you have a really, really big atom sharing a covalent bond with a little, little bitty atom, it's probably lopsided electrically. It's probably going to be polar. Another thing you can do is to look at the periodic table. Electronegativity tends to increase as you go from left to right on the periodic table and also from top to bottom. So if you have a little bitty atom way over here on the left sharing with 
a larger atom over here on the right, you probably have a polar molecule. For our purposes, the most electronegative atoms are the ones shown in the red boxes here. So nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. If you have other atoms attached to those, um, you've probably got a polar molecule. Here's an example of a polar and a nonpolar molecule. Over here on the left, we have ammonia. Now ammonia has this big old nitrogen sharing with three little bitty hydrogens. The nitrogen's gonna hog those electrons most of the time, so it will have a slight negative charge, and the hydrogens will have a slight positive charge. That's a polar molecule. It contains polar covalent bonds. On the right, we have a nonpolar molecule. Uh, methane or CH4. This is a carbon which is larger than hydrogens and it is sharing with four hydrogens but because they are distributed around that carbon pretty equally and because carbon isn't particularly electronegative they're going to share the electrons pretty evenly so we would call this a nonpolar molecule or we would say it contains nonpolar covalent bonds. I'd like you to practice determining whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. And you can complete this your turn by looking at your guided notes. What I want you to do is to look at each of these molecules and determine if they are polar or nonpolar based on their shape, also based on the differences in electronegativity that you see on the periodic table. So give it a try. Over here on the left, we have CO2. On the right, we've got water. And there are a couple of more on the next slide. Here's the rest of that your turn. On the left over here, you've got oxygen gas or O2. On the right, you've got HCl or hydrochloric acid. Determine whether these are polar or nonpolar and write it down on your guided notes. Bring it to class with you. All right, so we've been talking and talking about this polarity stuff. Why do we care about that? Well, it turns out that when you put two polar molecules together, they can form a new kind of bond with each other. And we call this kind of bond hydrogen bonds. These bonds often form between the hydrogen of one of the molecules and a different atom of another kind of molecule. Here we have a hydrogen bond forming between a water molecule and a molecule of ammonia. Now in a water molecule, the hydrogens have a slight positive charge. In ammonia, this nitrogen has a slight negative charge. So remember what Paula Abdul taught us, opposites attract. That partial positive, and that's what that little symbol means is po partial, um, is going to be attracted to this partial negative down here, and so they are attracted. We represent the hydrogen bond with a dotted line, and that's because it's actually a very, very weak little bond. So dotted lines mean hydrogen bonds. Because water molecules are so lopsided, they really readily form hydrogen bonds. Here we have a group of water molecules, and you can see all the little bonds forming between them, between those negative and positive parts of different atoms. All these little dotted lines in here. Hydrogen bonding is what allows water to form into droplets and to soak into paper towels and to do almost all of the really cool things that water does. We'll talk about this more in chapter three. The fourth kind of bond you need to know about is something called a van der Waals interaction or a van der Waals bond or attraction. Van der Waals interactions tend to occur between large molecules. And in large molecules, just because of the arrangement of their atoms, sometimes they will form little hot spots, little charges. For instance, let's say we've got a positive charge forming down here and a negative forming up here. Whenever you have large molecules with opposite charges, they can form an attraction, they can form a bond. And so you can see that it's represented with this little dotted line. Van der Waals interactions, like hydrogen bonds, are very weak. Collectively, though, they can be very strong. 
one really cool and interesting place that you see van der Waals in are the feet of geckos. Now, I don't know how much time you've spent thinking about gecko feet, but geckos are these little lizards and they have these weird little ridgy feet, weird alien looking feet. And if you were to zoom in on those ridges, what you'd find are thousands and thousands of microscopic little hairs that stick out. And what scientists have found is that the ends of those hairs can make van der Waals interactions with surfaces. So this is the reason that lizards such as this can run up walls. They can even climb on glass. In fact, one of the few things they can't climb on is Teflon. And that's because Teflon, non-stick coating, is designed to repel all kinds of little um, charges. So no charges, no van der Waals interactions. So they can't stick. And there's a cool little video down here at the bottom that hopefully we'll have time to watch in class. If not, I may stick it in the homework. But it talks all about gecko feet and van der Waals interactions. All right, you guys, that's the end of chapter two. Hopefully you've completed your guided notes. Make sure to do those your turns and bring them with you to class so we can work on this stuff some more. Have a great day.